Chapter 1 The lambs of Jesus, who are they, but children that believe and pray, that keep God's laws and ask His grace, and seek a heavenly dwelling place. The lambs of Jesus, they are meek, the words of peace and truth they speak. To all God's creatures they are kind, and like their Lord of gentle mind. Dr. Bertram was sitting in his study, busily writing letters, when someone tapped at the door of the room. The tap was soft and timid, and the doctor was so deeply involved in his writing that he did not hear it. There was another tap, this time a little louder. Come in, said Dr. Bertram, looking up from his writing. The door opened, and a very small boy came into the room. The doctor could barely see the boy's head above the other side of the table. Even though he was very small, the boy was stoutly built, and his sunburned face glowed with health. There was a cheerful twinkle in his eye. However, it was easy to see that he felt awed to be in the well-known doctor's presence. Dr. Bertram put down his pen and cast an amused glance at his little visitor. Well, little man, what do you want? I am George Whelan, sir. What did you come to see me about? I heard you wanted a boy, sir. Oh, said the doctor, and his amused look grew into a laugh as he looked at the size of the young boy. Do you know what I want a boy for? Yes, to deliver the medicine. I'm afraid you are not big enough, said Dr. Bertram kindly. Yes, sir, just give me a chance. I'm older than you think. I'm going to be eleven. Are you really? Yes, sir, really I am. I can read and write and add. Do let me try, sir. Please give me a chance. There was a confidence in the little fellow that pleased Dr. Bertram. Are you a good walker? he asked. I can keep up with any boy my age in Northcliffe, sir. I walked down the river to Norton and back with my uncle last week, and I wasn't tired a bit. Now listen to me, George, said the doctor. You may be right that you are a first-rate walker, and that you can read and write and add. You may be very strong, even though you are so small for your age. However, you may not be the kind of boy that I am looking for. George Wayland looked at the doctor in surprise. I want a boy who will tell the truth and work hard. One who feels that wasting his time while he should be working is robbing me. I want someone who would ask God to give him grace to be a faithful servant. I am looking for someone who would act the same when I am gone as when I am looking over his shoulder. Would you try to be that kind of boy for me, George? Yes, sir, answered the child with that same confident tone as before. You cannot do all of this by yourself, boy, continued Dr. Bertram. God will give you the strength if you ask him. Do you go to Sunday school? Yes, sir. I have been going every week for several years. I am glad, and I would like it if you continued to do that. You will never have to deliver on Sunday until after church. You can still go to Sunday school and to the house of God. Then you are going to give me a chance, sir? exclaimed George eagerly. I didn't say that, did I? asked the doctor with a smile on his face. But I thought... I believe you thought right. I will ask about you in town, and if I am happy with what I hear, I will give you a chance. Thank you, sir. When can I find out if you will? Stop by tomorrow night, said the doctor. Good night, sir, said the boy, and with his best Sunday school bow, George left for home. The next evening, George Wayland came bounding into the room where his mother was busy ironing. Mother, mother, Dr. Bertram is going to try me, and I am going to get six dollars a week. I'm so excited. 
Mrs. Wayland was as pleased as her son was, for she had a large family, and George was her oldest boy. Even though money was very tight, she had worked hard to keep him in school until now. Very often she could not afford it, and she would have been glad if George could have helped earn his keep. However, she knew how important education was to the future of her son. For this reason, Mrs. Wayland often denied herself many comforts, so George could continue his schooling. One of the neighbours had often said to her, I wonder how you can go on working and slaving as you do, Mrs. Wayland. That boy George of yours is quite able to earn something. Why, my boy Will began to earn money before he was nine years old. But the neighbour did not mention that her Will was now a large, ignorant boy who could hardly write his own name, and who would probably never be anything more than a common labourer. A child without an education is like a boy trying to find his way through a house without any windows to let in the light. Education is the window of the mind. George was eagerly looking forward to the following Monday, when he would begin his duties for the doctor. His mother was extremely busy trying to get the things he needed to start work. She managed to buy him a sturdy pair of boots with very thick soles to keep his feet dry. Then she made him an excellent raincoat to wear in wet weather. George's father had been a coachman, and Mrs. Wayland used one of his old capes to make George's new coat. As the Sunday school teacher sat down among the boys the next morning, she noticed George's excited expression. Well, George, she said, you look like you are bursting with good news. Will you tell us about it? I am not going to school any more on weekdays, ma'am, because I have a job at Dr. Bertram's. He is going to pay me six dollars every week, and I'll be able to help mother now. I'm so happy, ma'am. His little grey eyes twinkled more than ever as he spoke. "'That is very good news indeed, George,' said his teacher. "'I am glad to see that you have the proper attitude about helping your mother. "'Every child should feel like that. "'Too often children forget how many years they have been too young to help earn their own keep.' "'Isn't George lucky?' said one of the other children. "'I have never had a chance like that.' Perhaps you never looked hard enough for one, said the teacher. How did you happen to get this opportunity, George? I heard that Dr. Bertram wanted a boy, ma'am. I thought it couldn't hurt to go and ask him about it. That's the way to be, George. I hope you will still be able to come to Sunday school. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Bertram told me I should always do that. I am very glad, George. You will have many temptations in your new life, even though it looks so bright to you right now. I would be happy to give you a little friendly advice now and then. We have known each other for a long time, George. It has been more than three years, ma'am. You have always been a good and attentive student. God alone can rule our naturally sinful minds. I hope that he will help you follow the lessons that I have tried so hard to teach you. What kind of temptations will George have, ma'am? asked one of the boys. I will tell you a few. In the first place, other boys may often tempt him to waste his time. He may forget that his time is no longer his own property when he begins working for someone else. Mrs. Oldham, does that mean that George won't ever be able to play? I didn't say that. You know the old saying, All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. I am sure that Dr. Bertram remembers it too. No reasonable employer would try to make a young boy into an adult by never allowing him time to himself. What I meant to warn George about is thinking that he has the right to do what he likes with his time. I would be surprised if he doesn't have quite a bit of time to play after his work is done. However, I have seen many errand boys waste their employer's time playing, instead of doing the job they were told. 
I thought it was important to warn George against acting like that. Also, in his case, a delay in delivering a package might cause someone to die. Oh, ma'am, how could that happen? cried two or three of the students at once. A sick person might die because he needed a particular medicine which should have arrived long before it did. The boy who was in charge of delivering it was playing along the way. I never thought of that, Mrs. Oldham, said George. Probably not. I only mentioned it to show how important it is for a lad to do his duty faithfully. He can never tell what the consequence for failing to do so might be. I knew of a boy who was sent to the post office with a letter. He was told especially to hurry, because it was very important that the letter go out that night. The boy started out, meaning to do what was right. He met some of his friends on the way, and they asked him to stop and play a game of marbles with them. He gave in to the temptation, instead of resisting it. The letter, which was a request for a son to come see his dying father, got to the post office too late. The boy's neglect caused the letter to arrive a day late. When the son finally got to the village, his poor father had been dead only a few hours. Another temptation that boys have, when they are in a house where there is plenty to eat, is to steal just a few little things. What does the Eighth Commandment say about your duty to your neighbour? The boys thought for a moment. Then George answered, To keep my hands from picking and stealing, ma'am. Right, George. And picking means taking little things. It is when a boy that is sent for a glass of milk takes a drink when he thinks no one is looking. When a servant takes a piece of fruit out of a pie, or a spoonful of jelly from the jar. That is picking. Picking and stealing, answered the boys. Yes, boys. All of these kinds of acts are dishonest in God's sight. We must be true and just in everything we do, whether it is little or great. When we think about these things, we can see how easy it is to be tempted to break God's commandments. We need to pray, Lord, have mercy upon us, and cause our hearts to keep thy law. If we are careful about watching our conduct, we will see how often we fail to deal honestly and justly with others. We will find that we do need God's mercy and grace to be able to keep his laws. There is one other thing that I would like to tell you about boys who begin working. They must practice what they have learned at school or they will quickly forget all they have learned. If it is possible, they should spend a half an hour to an hour every night practicing their reading and writing. This time will be well spent. I will give you a spelling book, George, so you can practice writing every night, even if it is only a few words. When you have filled the book, I will give you another one. When the class ended, Mrs. Oldham told George to come over to her house the next day if he had time. She would give him the spelling book, a pencil, and a small journal. In the journal, he could write down special things he wanted to remember. Dr. Bertram was respected by both the rich and the poor. Mrs. Wayland was very thankful that her boy had found such a good employer for his start in the world. Monday morning came and it looked like it was going to rain. In his new boots and thick raincoat, George happily set off for his first day at work. He would come home to sleep every night, so there weren't any sad goodbyes. His mother and his little brother and sister all stood at the cottage door, watching him go down the street. "'Doesn't George look like a man now, mother?' said the next oldest boy, Willie. A very little man, said Mrs. Whalen, smiling. In his case, I hope it will be like the old saying, little but good. When George arrived at Dr. Bertram's house, there was a little pony carriage standing at the door. 
a pleasant-looking old lady was just stepping into it. This was Mrs. Bertram, the doctor's mother. She looked intently at George as he passed her and headed toward the office door. Then she called him to her. "'Is your name Wayland?' she demanded. "'Yes, ma'am.' "'Are you the new boy, then?' "'Yes, ma'am.' "'Is this your first job?' "'Yes, ma'am.' "'Then you can look at today as if it is the starting point in your life, my boy. "'You are just beginning to journey up the hill. "'I am nearly at the top. "'Pray to God to help you run the race well that is set before you. "'Whom are you to look to as an example?' "'To our blessed Saviour, ma'am,' said George. "'The old lady smiled approvingly at George's answer. "'She told him, that as long as he acted properly, she would always be his friend. "'Do you like little animals?' she asked, when she saw the little boy's twinkling eyes fixed on the pony. "'Oh, very much, ma'am!' And encouraged by the lady's kind manner, George patted the neck of the pretty animal. "'Then, if you are fond of them, I hope you will never treat them badly.' I am afraid that some boys think it is brave to hurt and torture poor, dumb creatures, but they are very wrong. A really brave boy is kind and gentle, and never intentionally hurts another living thing. He remembers that his Creator in Heaven made everything which is alive. Goodbye for now, George. I shall see you again by and by. And Mrs. Bertram set off on her morning ride.